Tonight we're looking at Matthew chapter 20. You say, we've been in Luke for so long. Well, now we're looking at a parallel parable. In other words, we find two passages dealing with the same parallel. <laughs> two parallel passages dealing with the parable. Parallel and parable are different words. But we find the parallel passage to Luke 19 is now Matthew chapter 20. And I've chosen to look at Matthew. And that's why in your notes, Matthew is listed first, then Luke in parentheses, because this is not unique, like we have been looking at unique parables. Now we have two accounts of the same parable. You can read the Luke version later, but that's very short. It's only four verses. We're looking at Matthew's account because it's more thorough. Remember what Matthew said in chapter 13, verses 10 and 11. He said, and the disciples came and said, why do you speak unto them in parables? You know this already, but he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given. The world doesn't understand. And so Jesus is speaking mysteries to the world, and that's why people in the world don't understand the Bible. If they were saved and the Spirit were dwelling in them, they'd understand it more thoroughly. They understand bits and pieces enough to confuse them. The Bible said when they start to understand something, the devil comes along and plucks that seed out, and they're confused again. And the God of this world hath blinded their minds to the truth of the gospel. And so uh, we find here tonight our 15th pre and parable, written by, or given to us tonight by Matthew. Remember, his first name was Levi, which meant harmony. And then his name was changed by the Lord Jesus to Matthew, which meant gift of Jehovah. And so we're looking at this parable in Chapter 20, and remember, parables are identified by two words, like and as. And tonight we'll see that in Matthew 20. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder. Now mark that word householder, draw a line over to verse 11. Verse 11, it's translated a little differently, but it's the same word. Here it's translated good man of the house rather than householder. How many of you, uh, I thought I thought it when I was sitting there, how many of you sinned today? Right, every hand. All right, how many did the, now we do the right hand, did the right thing and confessed it? When you confess it, you say, but I did it ten times, confess it ten times. When you do, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. You say, well, I, ten times. Confess means to agree with God. When he convicts you, Confess it, you've agreed with him that you've done the wrong thing, and immediately you're cleansed. It's not the same as repentance. When you got saved, you repented. And you had to have a turnaround and begin to turn against that sin. But you will sin as long as you're in this body, won't you? Yes, you will. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, I, I meant to say that, and it came back to my mind, so I thought that needed to be said. There's certain principles that if we teach people over and over and over, they get it, and it makes a change in their life. And confessing sin is so vitally important. When you get that, it's going to help your prayer life greatly because you don't have anything between you and God. And you can write down Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 or Psalm 66, 18 and look those up and see what happens when you have unconfessed sin in your life. It says God will not hear you. So praying's a waste of time until you confess your sin. Prayer is agreeing together and uh, asking God for his help it has nothing to do with our text. But look at our text. We Jesus had just finished telling the story in verse 22 of the rich man who went away because he was told to give up his possessions. So look at 1922. It says, Jesus said to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast and give it to the poor, and thou hast treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So many great principles in verse 22 of chapter 19. Treasure in heaven. You want to know how to get it, get treasure in heaven? There it is. Give. And then come and follow me. And he, he was testing the man because the man, he knew the man's heart and the man was materialistic. It's always amazing to me how Jesus knows hearts and he'll go at one person one way and another another way. He knew this guy had a problem with materialism. He said, fine. Go sell everything and follow me. That's the test. And, uh, here now we pick up in verse 
20, and he starts out saying for, and that connects these two chapters. Remember, there aren't chapter divisions in the Bible. We tend to forget that. We, we find chapter divisions and we think that God put them there and God didn't. The Bible's written in scroll form. We have codex, which means we turn pages. They were all in one long scroll. You had to roll it out. Isaiah, we told you, is 26 foot long. So you roll out the scroll of Matthew, pretty long scroll, probably 10 feet long, and, and then you roll it back up. And they carried these skins around and that was their, their Bible. So he begins saying for connecting this previous, previous text. And also in the previous text, we're going to look at two verses, verse 27 and 28. And these also help lead into the parable and the answer. Then Peter said unto him, Behold, we've forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have? <laughs> Boy, oh, Peter. I, I love Peter and he did a lot for God, but right here, his heart's really not right. In verse 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto thee, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration or meaning the new birth, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So there's another principle there, that the twelve followers of Jesus will sit on the twelve and rule the twelve tribes. Isn't that interesting? Now, Judas, who's going to sit in his place? A lot of argument over that. We don't know. That's the answer. We don't know. Well, Matthew was chosen to replace him, and then there's Paul, who is called to be an apostle. So who is it? We don't know. And that's one thing as a pastor we have to learn to say. I know pastors that have a comment on everything and they know everything, but they can't back it up. And so when we don't know, it's best for your pastor to be honest and say the Scripture does not give us that answer. We know who 11, who 11, 11 guys and that 11 of these guys will sit on the throne. The 11, we know who they are, but Judas will not. So we know another will replace him, maybe Matthias, maybe Paul. Back to our text. So Jesus is saying here for, which connects these chapters, and he's going to teach a system of reward. And this is really important because there's a lot of talk today about work and unions and contracts and pay and minimum wage. and we, we, This is all going on in our world right now. I mean, they're talking about a minimum wage of $15. Well, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? You know, yeah, I want that dollar menu. What are you talking about? You're writing a dollar menu. It's a $5 menu now. And everything's going to change. I mean, it's going to affect everything. And I'm not opposed to raising minimum wage. I'm just more a free enterprise guy, and I believe in the principle of Scripture, which pretty much teach what you agree to work for, you work for. And that's the whole lesson tonight. The laborers come, and, and uh, he sends them out. We pick up. It says that he had agreed with laborers for a penny in that day, and he sent them into his venue. The word sent, by the way, you ought to mark that in your Bible. It's the word apostle, apostello. Because what is an apostle? A sent one. And that's the word here. So you just learned a Greek word that you already knew, right? So they came to him, and he, he agreed with them, and he sent them into the vineyard. He said a penny a day. Well, at 9 o'clock, he sees people standing around. He needs some workers, so he goes into the marketplace and says, go into the vineyard. Go into the vineyard. I, you know, you can, you can work as well. At noon, he goes out and hires more. At 3 o'clock, he hires more. In verse 6, he goes out at 5 o'clock and hires more. At the end of the day, he hires even some more workers. In verse 7, he says, go, and, and it's urgent. The harvest is ready. Now, there's a typology here, too. This also teaches us a type, that the harvest is ready, and God needs laborers. You see that? Can you see the typology there? He says, man, it's urgent. He's going to recruit more people to send into the field and reap the harvest. What are we supposed to be doing right now? We're supposed to be planting seed because the harvest is near. When Jesus comes, it's too late to pick any fruit. Can't do anything. It's too late to call that person you were concerned about and witness, hey, you're out of this world in the twinkling of an eye, and they're left behind. And if they had the gospel and an opportunity to be saved, I don't believe they're going to get more opportunity. But anyway, he has all these people. Then in verse 8, he calls them to come and receive their pay, or the reward. It's translated wages, and rewards, several ways in Scripture. And they all receive the same pay. They all got a penny, you know, one day's pay. 
Now, what should their attitude be? Their attitude should be, well, that's, that's what I agreed to work for. But it didn't work that way, did it? They started to complain, murmur, and gripe, and argue. This isn't right. He just, he just worked for an hour. And I've been here since early this morning. We've got the same pay. But you agreed to work for the same pay. And I'll tell you what we've lost in our world. We've lost the ability to keep our word and work for what we agreed to work for. And while I understand it doesn't seem fair, another principle is taught here, the fact that God's reward system doesn't sometimes seem fair. But it all works out in heaven. I mean, how is it that one Christian's a multimillionaire? I don't know. It's not me. <laughs> how is it that one person is a great athlete and another person struggles just to get by in life? I think a little Stephanie, Conroy's daughter, doesn't seem fair. But grace isn't fair either, is it? Think of people who have got a lot more grace than you have. Think of people who have sinned way worse than you and got all that grace and they got all this joy and you're like, what? You know, we don't understand, but we accept that God's way is right. And we're go back, going back to the work idea, what do we have going on today? People who agree to work for a certain amount and then they decide it's not enough, they go on strike. When you agree to a certain benefit package for a certain amount of time, when you go on strike, you are sinning. I'm not anti-union. I'm careful. I preached up in West Virginia for 10 years. And I remember going and seeing those coal miners, hardworking people, man. They'd come out of the coal mines, go straight to Walmart, and you'd say, is that guy black or white? Because everything you, know, you could see where the glasses were. And then you'd say, oh, I, I see, I see who, who he is or what he is. Because they were covered in coal. It worked so hard. And it was not fair to them in the early days when those big rich people would come in and buy a mine. Pay them just enough to get by and say, but you have to live here in these apartments and you have to shop in my store and those people could never get out of the slums. And so when they had an opportunity to say enough is enough, they did. And so I'm not against unions, but I'm against the corruption and the sin and the dishonesty of unions. And we ought to be, right? When a union, when people agree to work and don't work, shame on them because they agreed. It wouldn't work in the military. It won't work in a lot of job markets, but somehow it works in unions. And, he, and, and I'm not anti-union. As I said, there are times we need unions. Some of you'd say, I work for a great union, Brother Dan. They were honest. They had integrity. We, when we agreed to a, a, a settlement or a contract, we would stick by it until it was up. Now, that's perfectly fine. But, you know, we have to ex examine each union and each situation. But when you agree to do something, we rent one-third of our building over at the mission to a lawyer. And here's how it went. I said, how does a thousand bucks say? He said, fine. I said, shake on it. That's all we did. Don't have a lease. You say, but he could cheat you or, or you, you know, you could do him wrong. I, I understand contracts are smart and I always advise to do it, but he and I are pretty old school. You know, I grew up in a different era. I mean, if you agreed with somebody for something and they didn't do it, we would fight sometimes, and that's how we settled it. And there weren't any lawsuits. The guy with the sorest nose lost. Now, that's wrong. Fighting's wrong. I'm not saying that. But, you know, things have changed. Everything sue, 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 sue now. No offense, Lloyd, to your wife, Sue. But suing people, isn't that common now? I, I Oh, I just can't stand it when I see a lawyer advertisement. You see somebody, they got me, and I'm thinking, what was wrong with you? How did you get a million dollars? You're jumping around, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, all that is is sin. Do we need lawyers? Yes. Are there people who get hurt? Yes. Lose a limb? Man, they need to be compensated the rest of their life. They need to be paid if they're in a wheelchair, paid the rest of their life, have a good life. I agree with all that, but you and I know that the system's gotten out of hand. Everyone today wants something for nothing. <laughs> and I, I, I guess I, last Sunday night I gave you some of that. 
Sunday morning, Father's Day, you're going to get some of that again, talking about fathers and what they need to do with their sons. But the fact of the matter is, we all know it's true, we see it in front of us, and I hope that none of us in this room or in this church get to a place where, hey, I'm going to sue somebody because I have an opportunity. And uh, while I was here as pastor in this church, and I, I, and I should have called it out then, we had someone suing someone else over their, their parents' inheritance. And I go to court, and I'm so embarrassed to walk in there, and both sides are there. And I said, I'm not here for either of you. This is wrong, and walked out. Now, none of them people are here. You, most of you don't know who, who they are. Maybe you feel you could think real hard and maybe figure out bits and pieces of that. But they could have been called out public anyway, so I'm not doing anything wrong here tonight. They're not here. I'm not embarrassing them. But here's the thing. Many people don't think anything's wrong with that. And a lot of people in churches don't think anything's wrong with that. A good doctor who works really hard, person gets an infection, they sue the doctor. The infection may not have been the doctor's fault at all. It may have been something that was in the patient. The germ might have been there before the surgery. But they get rich, and the malpractice insurance is expensive, and doctors' fees are going up, and we're complaining about their fees. Folks, enough is enough, and I don't know what our country can do to stop it all. And again, I'm not saying there shouldn't be malpractice suits. I understand that. We have some bad doctors. Some of you may have been butchered by a doctor. I understand that. You deserve a settlement. But my point is, you and I know that all this stuff has gone crazy, hasn't it? And it's just too much of it. I was at the, I told you this story, I think. I was at the Atlanta Braves game years ago. I had my hip replaced in my 50s. I know you thought I was 39. But I'm, I'm going through the parking lot with my walker to get up to the gate, and it's like forever. Because I didn't want to use the handicap thing, and I didn't have a sticker anyway, so I couldn't use it. I'm getting close, and I get up to where all the handicap spots are, and people are pulling in there, jumping out of their vehicles, and sprinting up to get ahead of the line to get tickets, and I'm like, what's wrong with this? I don't even like the Braves that well. I'm a Tigers fan. My son's a Braves fan, so I went. And I'm like, and they're getting up there and getting all the tickets, the best seats, and I'm like, I'm waiting in a long line, and I'm thinking, once again, our system at work. So many people have a little surgery and they get a handicap. Folks, the lesson here is clear. You agree to work for something, you work for it, you don't expect anything more than that. Right? That's what he says. So look in verse 8. Called the laborers again the money, and when they came, that were, they heard, heard, they hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, the last have wrought but one hour. And I'm paraphrasing, we've been here all day. But the owner of the land said, verse 13, he said unto them, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? There's a lesson right there, mark it. You agreed. And I know it's tough. I have a friend that builds, he's in, you know, he does contracts. And he says, sometimes you get in a project and you tear it open and all of a sudden there's a whole lot more, more work than you anticipated and you got to call the owner and say, we agreed to this. This wasn't part of it. Do you want me to stop? That's tough stuff. I'm not saying it's easy on either side. But we have to be people of our word and do the best we can to keep our word. All of us have broken our word, haven't we? Confess it and move on. But we all know we've experienced things like this. But I want you to notice something else here. I thought it's interesting. There are two Greek words in the Bible translated friend. One is the word philios, which is translated brotherly love and also translated friend. There's a friend that sticks us closer than a brother and you love that guy. So the word friend can mean philios, a great close relationship. And Jesus uses it a lot. But here he doesn't use that word. He uses a word, he uses a word, and it's in your notes. And he uses a word, just a uh, translated friend, but it's really just simply an acquaintance. 
And I thought it's interesting, he uses this word acquaintance here for this guy because he didn't have brotherly love for this worker, but he's respectful. But this same word is what Jesus used to address Judas. Isn't that interesting that he did not address Judas with brotherly love? Why? Because Jesus knew his heart. So he always used the weaker word for friend because he knew Judas would betray him. I just think that's interesting. That's a sidebar, side note, whatever. But he says here, um, they, they complain, I've wrought, you know, all this. And, and he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. And then verse 11, take that, that what is thine and go thy way, and I'll give unto the, la- the last even as unto thee. It's not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own. With mine own. Is thine I evil because I am good? He, you know, he, he's, he said, because I'm generous to those that came along later, am I a bad person? In other words, you should be happy for those who came along later instead of being jealous, right? I mean, let's face it, envy is a big problem in our world too. Now, I don't like it when I work for a place and someone new comes in and they pay them more than me. It's a natural tendency for that to bother the flesh. But I agreed to work for a certain amount, you know? Sometimes I've had to go to a boss and say, hey, you know, I know I harden at this, but I want to raise. Sometimes it's because I know that they're paying somebody who's worthless more than me, and I, I want to raise. That's okay. But when we agree to do something, we need to stand by our word. I'm not saying it's wrong to ask for a raise. I know you can't ask for raises when you work in a union sometimes, you, you know, but as an individual, free enterprise, you can go to your boss and say, I need more money. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my skill level is, is worth more money, and that's okay. So I'm not saying that it's wrong to ask for a raise, and I'm not saying it's wrong to point out injustice in our world. But if you're envy because someone uh, is getting blessed when you think you deserve better, you know, you're, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. He talks here about an evil eye. And what that really means in Proverbs 28, 22, it says an evil eye talks about the, really the stingy eye, you know, and, and it's translated several ways, but, you know, he, he's saying here, because I'm gracious toward those that work later, you should be envious because I'm good to them. And I, I think we make the, the application to grace, and we've already made that a few moments ago, that some people will seem to get more grace from God than you, and you have to be careful. It's a matter of trusting God. When we get to heaven, we'll understand. We see through a glass dimly now, darkly. We can't hardly see things now. When we get to heaven, we'll see clearly, the Bible says. Isn't that going to be great to understand everything? And then he, close, he closes here. He says, um, The last should be first, and the first last, for many are called and, and few are chosen. And that's a real popular um, verse. I've heard it misquoted so often, this last verse. The last be first. We know that. We've said that. Stephanie in heaven will be really something. Chuck will be really something. Because to us, it seems like they weren't dealt a fair deal in this life. And think of all the other people. Had a little girl in our church, 12 years old, born. She's never gotten out of a wheelchair. She died, went to be the Lord at 14, trusted Christ. She's this big on machines all the time. How fair is that? You know? From our perspective, that's not fair at all. But in heaven, we'll understand. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Well, that's a good verse. But you have a couple notes here, too, to look at. Here it says, uh, many are called and few chosen. The word chosen is translated elect. Did you know you're part of the elect? You're chosen by God? Did you have a choice in the matter? Absolutely. And a lot of people don't understand that there's such a debate between predestination and being chosen, it's called Calvinism. I was raised a five-point Calvinist in the Christian Reformed Church. 
We left the church because my dad didn't agree with limited atonement. He said, John said, you know, that he died for the sins of the whole world. He just didn't just die for the elect. So my dad struggled with that concept. Then my dad believed in immersion, so we left, went to the Baptist church. And it's hard to harmonize those two things, that we're chosen and that whosoever will may come. And it's crazy, but in God's foreknowledge, he says, whosoever will may enter in. When we go in, we look back, and it says, you're chosen before the world began. And you're like, wait a minute. I repented and chose him, but he chose me absolutely. In his foreknowledge, he knew you'd be saved, and he chose you. And I, ca I can't explain it a lot of times. And that, that's one thing with those that are hyper-Calvinist. They have to stand by some of their ideas because when they can't explain it and understand it, they have to try to come up with a plan to make it make sense. Not everything in the Bible makes sense, but you were chosen, and whosoever will may come. Right? We accept both those things here. And now several great scholars, they gave some names of people who, when it talks about the many are called, means it's a reference to being called to the gospel, and that's a good sound teaching. And then few are chosen. They believe that that could maybe just, just refer to being chosen to do the work of God, like chosen in ministry. So we'll look at some verses in Romans real quick. You have them, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. And then we'll make this application to our life here in a moment. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. So there is a calling, there is a matter of being chosen. Then Romans 1.6, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. That means to be set apart. So here Paul's called to be an apostle. He says, you believers are called to be set apart. Did you know all of us are called to be set apart? It's the word sanctify, same Greek word. To be sanctified, set apart, or holy, those are all the same word. God calls you to holiness. He calls you to sanctification. He calls you to be set apart. We need to be different. We're called to be different. Not odd and weird. Years ago, I had a guy in college, couldn't hardly get near him, Bible college, because he was weird. He thought being different in the world meant to be an oddball. You know, it, no matter what clothing I put on, he said, that's worldly. And I said, these are blue jeans. I know, blue jeans are worldly. Everything was worldly. And he was an oddball. He never, ever was effective in reaching people with the gospel because he thought being different meant to be weird. We don't have to be weirdos, <laughs> okay? We have to be real. So many Christians are so pious. Oh, brother. You, know, you can see right through that. Years ago, I had a friend named Doug, and Doug was real, you know? I walked to his house one day, Chuck and I were walking, and he was working on a car. And we'd hear him hollering and screaming, and wrenches come flying out from under the car. Yeah, he never hit anything. <laughs> he, was, he was a Christian, but he wasn't pious at all. He let it all hang out. You don't need to go that far to be real, but we have to be real. You know, when you're sad and you're hurting, it's okay to say, I'm really struggling. Don't say it's okay. It's okay. God's in control. It's okay to say to people, and I'm really having a hard time. I'm very discouraged. I need your prayer. Did you know the Bible said confess your faults one to another? Didn't say your sins, but your faults. Did you know, guys, it's okay to have an accountability partner and call them up and say, I got this girl at work that's flirting with me, pray for me, because, I mean, I really struggle with my thought life with her. That's okay. Call and get accountability. I have accountability partners in my life. Call and say, you know, I want to punch my neighbor right in the kisser. Remember old Jackie Gleason? One of these days I'm going to send you to the moon. It's going to hit Alice right in the kisser. And, uh, you know, we all feel like that. Don't be pious and act like you don't struggle. All of us struggle. That's why I put you on the spot. How many sinned today? Made you, for a moment, be real. <laughs> it's okay to be real. It's okay to say, Larry, man, I'm having a hard time. It's okay to say, Jim, man, 
I want to kill that renter. <laughs> I used to rent property. I'd call Jim up, get over here, Jim. I need you to witness or something. I got some nut here that's smashing my windows, you know? It's okay just to be real and for people to see your weakness and see that you're a normal human being. It, that's why the Catholic Church has suffered so much. They put them up on these pedestals. They wear these robes, and they say they're infallible. Oh, my word. Talk about disaster waiting to happen. Don't ever think I'm infallible. I am not sinless. <laughs> Hello, I've told you enough times. And don't ever put me on a pedestal and revere your pastor. Listen to the word of God when I preach, but realize I am just like you, Mike. Put on my pants the same way, battle the same battles you do. And so I'm rambling, but look at Romans 1. Or Romans. Well, we've already looked at enough in Romans. Let's, let's make the application to our life now. And we can look up these verses, really. We only have about three minutes left, and some of this you can do at home. But we know that first being last, we understand that principle. But we think of the prodigal son in the same story there. Remember the older brother? Dad, that's not fair. You see, by law, the older brother get a, get, were, were to get a double inheritance, and his brother already got his inheritance so the double that's left is for the older brother. And now the young one comes back and he's going to get a robe and new sandals and a fatted calf and a calf and a party. That's not fair. Once again, upset because his younger brother gets grace. I used to, my kids, you know, had four boys. I told people, Eeny, Meeny, Miney, and Joe. They said, what about Mo? I said, there ain't going to be no Mo. But I had these, these four boys and if one got a spank or something. Well, I couldn't remember 10 days later what I spanked. What I, I didn't spank the next one. Why did I get a spanking and he didn't get one? Remember Peter? Lord, you just told me I'm going to be crucified, John 21. What's going to happen to John who's leaning right here by Jesus on his chest? Peter, that's not your concern. You worry about Peter. It didn't seem fair. So we look at these verses, and, and you can highlight some of these in your Bible. We just don't have time to look at all of them. We're out of time, but you can look at these. God gives grace to the humble. We're to be clothed. First Peter 5, 5, we're to be clothed in humility. What does God give to the humble? Grace. What are we to do under God's hand? Verse First Peter 5, 6, we're to humble ourselves. Back up to 1, 7, answer. When will we give God glory for suffering? Answer. When we will give God glory for suffering, First Peter one seventeen tells us in the next life. Um, we can look at Acts seven sixty, and that's that's the last thing we'll do. Remember Stephen? Do you know the word crown? There's two words crown in the Bible. Two Greek words translate crown. One is diadem, which is really the ultimate crown. The other is Stephanos, named after Stephan. What happened to Stephen? Acts 7. He was killed. But a crown is named after him because of the way he died. He died as a champion, didn't he? And he died as a champion because he, what he said in, in Acts 7, 60. And we'll close with this. Remember how Jesus died? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, you talk about the hero, Jesus Christ. What a hero. The ultimate hero. The perfect son of God. The lamb that was slain who will one day come back as a roaring lion and take control of this world. The gentle, patient, meek, and humble Lord who will one day conquer the world. He's our hero. But Stephen was so much like him. He's stoned to death. And look what he says in verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. He's being stoned. He's dying. Lord, meaning master here, this is New Testament, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said that, he fell asleep. He died. Now, for us, death is like falling asleep, right? Because we wake up in heaven. He said, lay not this sin to their charge. You know, you'd think he'd say, Lord, get even with these people. Vengeance is yours, Lord. Now, 
God, forgive. Just like Jesus said, forgive them, Lord. Don't put this on them. What a great way to go out. Isn't that cool? I don't know. Is cool even a word anymore, guys? Is it cool in here tonight? Um, I don't know. When I was young, we guys used the word cool, and then later, you know, we, we used the word hot. I don't know whether I'm hot or cold, but I, I want to be one or the other. I don't want to be spewed out of, mouth, out of the mouth of the Lord, right? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Tonight, I just felt your presence here, Lord, speaking through your word. And I don't know the hearts, but you do. And I just pray your word will bless some, rebuke others, encourage some, whatever is necessary. Convict, exhort, but we know that you are God alone. It's your Holy Spirit works. So we ask you to bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.